On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you, even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. And the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Aswaris. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai, and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, 
the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favour in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish, and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Aswara said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he? Who has dared to do this? And King Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garment, garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance of the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you and praise you today that sinners can know your love and protection. Help us to taste and to see the sweetness and the majesty of your covenant love on those who are yours through Christ. Give to us now ears to hear your voice and give to us feet to respond and to journey toward you as you speak to us now in the pages and in the words that we have before us. We pray, Father, for an outpouring here of your Holy Spirit to arrest the distracted, to humble the proud, to restore the backslidden, to strengthen the faint-hearted, and to save the lost. And Father, we look to you for all these things, knowing full well that we cannot accomplish them in our own strength. Would you hear us? And would you answer from heaven? And would you stretch out your arm and do what only you can do, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. King Solomon said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Back in the 90s, a a friend of mine was traveling on the London underground. Uh, Mobile phones had just become cool, and the man that walked into his carriage had one. Uh, He talked on his phone as as loudly as he could when uh, someone in his carriage went into cardiac arrest. The passengers looked to the man, and they asked him to, to call an ambulance. But it was in that moment that this man had to pull these words out of his mouth, it's not a real phone. (laughs) 
pride goes before a fall. We continue our, our series in the book of Esther today, and that, that old adage, pride goes before a fall, sums up Esther chapters 5 to 7 perfectly. If you missed uh, the last two messages in this series, or if you could just do with a reminder, let me add my reminder to, to Matt's reminder a few minutes earlier. The book of Esther took place about 500 years before the birth of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. The king at the time, King Ahasuerus, or King Xerxes, as his name is in Greek, had taken Esther, uh, a young orphan Jewish girl, to be his wife and to be the new queen of Persia, much to the dismay of Mordecai, her older cousin who had raised her. Well, last week, Haman, uh, the king's second in command, had gotten the king's permission to commit genocide. Haman was a proud man. And when Haman saw that Mordecai, Esther's cousin, wouldn't bow to him, wouldn't pay homage to him, he was enraged, so enraged, that he determined to murder not just Mordecai, but all of Mordecai's people, the Jews. And yet, only known to him, Esther, Queen Esther, was a Jew. And so last week's passage ended on a cliffhanger. Esther agreed to approach King Ahasuerus uninvited uninvited, to own her identity as a Jew and to plead on behalf of her people. And I've been reminding us over the last two weeks that the point of the book of Esther, when you stand back and when you take it all in as a whole, is that God's purposes are fulfilled through God's providence. Providence meaning God's ordering or God's arranging or God's governing of all things so that even though God's name never appears on the page in the book of Esther, God's work is seen between the lines. And I've been arguing that we we need the book of Esther in our lives because we need to learn to trust our sovereign God. That even when it looks like there is no plan, even when it looks like there is no one in control, even when there's no prophetic word, no prophetic dream, no prophetic uh, angelic messenger or vision, we are called to believe in God nonetheless, that God is working all things together for the good of those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. But as you heard from our reading a few moments ago, that truth is a coin with two sides. That yes, on the one side, God does work all things together for the good of, of those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. But on the other side, God works all things together for bad, for those who hate God and for those who reject his purposes. You see, underneath it all, the reason Haman was an enemy of the Jews is because Haman was an enemy of the, Jew, uh, of, of the Jews' God. And as you heard, things did not end well for Haman. The wheel of God's providence that was bringing deliverance ran him over. And I would therefore be a fool and a coward If I didn't warn those of you here today who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, because friend, if you continue to suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness, if you continue to harden your heart against Jesus' voice, and if you continue to quench the Holy Spirit of God, all things will work together for bad in your life. The blessings that you enjoy today will fatten you up for the slaughter tomorrow. But since the mega theme of the book of Esther is God's providence, could it be that God has providentially brought you here today to deliver you from Haman's side onto Jesus' side? Could it be that God brought you here For such a time as this. And could it be that Haman's pride and Haman's fall would be just the wake up call you need to repent of pride and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, may that be the case for you if you're here today and you are not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see first Haman's 
pride. And second, Haman's fall. First of all, then, Haman's pride. Because just when we thought that Haman's pride had had its fill last week, our passage today dangles us over its mouth. And when peering inside, we discover that Haman's pride was a bottomless pit, a monster whose appetite for self-glory couldn't be satisfied, a black hole that could swallow galaxies and still be hungry. Remember in in Esther chapter 5, Esther did the unthinkable. She approached the king uninvited, and in doing so, she risked her life. King Ahasuerus held out the golden scepter to her, thereby sparing her life. And he said, in essence to her, Esther, what is all this about? And Esther responded by inviting the king and Haman to two feasts. And it was on the way home from the first feast that Haman again saw Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the gate. And he noticed that he was sitting, not bowing, sitting, not standing, to honor him and to pay homage to him. And so despite the fact that Haman was second in command to the most powerful person in the world at the time, And despite the fact that he was able to to round up his wife Zeresh and and all of their friends and say in chapter 5 verse 11, the splendor of his riches uh, the number of uh, and boast of of the number of his sons, boast of the promotions with which the king had honored him and how he advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king and that he alone had been invited to the feast with Esther and the king. Haman let verse 13 crawl out of his mouth. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So that when his wife Zeresh and all his friends said, let a gallows 50 cubits high be made, which was about 75 feet high. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast, that is to the second feast. We read this idea pleased. Haman, and he had the gallows made. And just on an aside, gallows back then in Persia weren't what you hanged someone with with a noose. They were what you impaled somebody on. A person would be dropped onto a sharpened stake in the ground. And so evidently the 75-foot gallows that Haman had made matched the proportions of his pride. Now last week we, we traced Haman's hatred of the Jews back to the Amalekites, whose people had persecuted the Jews since the days of Moses. But Haman's pride had far deeper roots. Because Haman's pride and all pride goes all the way down to hell. What I mean by that is pride is Satan's choice sin. Pride is what caused the devil to rebel against God. Pride is what caused the devil to fall from heaven like a lightning bolt. And pride guarantees our destruction in hell with him if we don't repent of pride and get right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And friends, may Haman's pride convince you then that pride is always hungry and that pride will eat you alive as Haman himself was about to discover. But whereas Haman viewed self-glory a thing to be grasped, a thing to be seized, a thing to be held onto at all cost, Esther risked her life and her all for the sake of her people. She approached the king uninvited and in that moment she risked her all. And it was in that moment that Queen Esther's royal courage and wisdom radiated from her. It is fascinating. Queen Esther's name is referred to specifically as Queen Esther 14 times in this book. And all but one of them appear from chapter 5 onwards. In other words, when Esther selflessly identified herself with God's people, Her royal dignity was in full bloom despite the risk involved. 
And friends, when we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ, even though that will mean risk, the glory of our identity in him will be brought to full flower. Yes, we will put ourselves in the line of fire. We will find ourselves thrown into a war against the powers and the the principalities and the spiritual rulers and authorities over this present darkness. And yes, we may well lose the respect of friends and colleagues and family members, but that's when our identity in Jesus Christ will shine as a shaft of light in the domain of darkness. Just think about it, friends. When this story began, who was Esther? Esther was the most vulnerable, the most weak, the lowest person within the Persian Empire. She was a female orphaned Jewish girl. And she was taken by the king to satisfy the sex drive of a perverted pagan king. But when Esther dressed herself in royal robes and stood on behalf of her people, that is when she was really shown to be Queen Esther. The majesty of her courage and the majesty of her wisdom meant that her name could forever be written in letters of gold. And who was Haman? Second in command to the most powerful man in the world and yet whose pride was his downfall. And there are some of you here today who who need to own your identity as followers of Jesus Christ, but you are hesitating because you are well aware of what it might cost you. Some of you are in relationships that you should not be in. And if you were to stand and consistently own your identity in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a risk that you're going to feel a level of loneliness that perhaps you haven't felt for a very long time. Uh, Others of you perhaps have been uh, offered positions at work with greater power and influence and money and whatever else. And yet you know that role involves doing things and promoting things that Christians never should. And so you feel torn as a follower of Jesus Christ. But friend, listen, if you will side with Jesus and identify yourself with him and his people, it will be the making of you as a disciple. That's when your royal Dignity in Christ will be seen for what it is. That's when your membership in the chosen race and the royal nation, the royal priesthood will be on full display for all to see. If you seek to seize self-glory and hold on to it, you will lose it in the end. But if you will risk it all in order to stand with Jesus' people and with Jesus himself, you will gain it all back and then some, and in the end. And here's an encouragement to those of you who know that I'm speaking to you. If you will stand with Jesus and his his people, then you will be on the side of the one who has all things in control. Isn't that what we're seeing here in the book of Esther? He had it all under control. You'll have the backing of a God who can dispose of a of a queen here and of a tyrant over there to get you where you need to be in your life as a disciple of Christ what are the risks compared with that you just be faithful to do what God has called you to do and you let the chips fall for wherever he decides you just concern yourself with standing as a member of the body of Christ and with him and say, here I stand. I can do no other. So help me, God, and let goods and kindred go this mortal life or so, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. And here's an encouragement for you. Whatever you lose, for Jesus' sake, Jesus can make it all back up. Jesus takes nothing from us, that he does not restore in a greater, more lavish way. Jesus said this, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. 
And if ever you wanted a, a parable of that saying there, here it is in Esther chapters 5 to 7. Haman was first, but he would end up last. Esther was last, but she would end up first. And that's what I call a good deal. So we've thought then about Haman's pride. Uh, and second, I want us to see Haman's fall. Chapter 6 and 7 recount Haman's fall to us, don't they? And it was the most spectacular fall, was it not? I wish I had time to read uh, chapters 6 and 7 to us again. But let me just very briefly summarize what happened in those two chapters. And then I'll pull out some words of application for us. Haman was on his way to get the king's permission to have Mordecai impaled on the gallows in Persia. But it, it just so happened that King Ahasuerus had a sleepless night. And it just so happens that the king asked for the chronicles, the, the, the stories of notable deeds to be, to be read to him. And it just so happened that of all the chronicles to be read to him, it would be, the, it would be something that happened five years before that he had no idea about Mordecai's uncovering of an assassination plot on his life and, and the rescue of the king's life. So that by the time Haman arrived, the king asked him, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 6, what should be done? So the man whom the king delights to honor, well, in his pride, Haman assumed that the king was talking about him. Well, Haman, uh, Haman says, verse 7, for the, ki- for the man whom the king delights to honor, that is me, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden on and and whose head a royal crown is set and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most notable officials let him let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city proclaiming before him thus shall it be to the man whom the king delights to honor but to Haman's horror the king handed the blank check that he just written to Mordecai his enemy. And Haman had to be the one to lead Mordecai around the city, proclaiming his praise and proclaiming his honor. It doesn't get much more horrible for Haman than that. But things were about to get much worse because when Haman finally hurried off to the second feast, he had no idea that he was being hurried to his execution and to his slaughter. The king asked Esther for the, for the third time, Esther, what is all this about? Why did you approach me uninvited? Why did you risk your life? Chapter 7, verse 3, then Queen Esther answered, if I, had found favor, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. For our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who has dared to do this? And, and Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And as you heard from our reading, his face was covered. And he was impaled on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Pride goes before a fall. And in this case, Haman's fall was a deadly fall. So church, what are we to make of all of this? Well, let me start by saying this. God does not need us. Why do I say that? God does not need us. Well, notice that the hinge on which this story turns is the king's sleepless night. Mordecai and Esther had nothing to do with that. Mordecai and Esther didn't spike his drink with caffeine. They didn't even pray that he would have a sleepless night. Not not that we know of anyway. God simply removed sleep from him. And in so doing, the Jews were put in the most favorable light before 
the king. Do you see that the turning point of this story had nothing to do with Mordecai or Esther at all? And as the world around us crumbles, and as, as the world around us looks like it is being thrown to hell in a handbasket, yes, we are to plan. Yes, we are to strategize. Yes, we are to dream a dream of, of winning lost men and women for Jesus Christ. Of course we are, but we are to do that in the knowledge that ultimately salvation is of the Lord. That God is just fine without us. That God is just fine without me. And when he wants to save a countless number of people from annihilation, he can do that simply by removing something as easy as sleep. For the God who made the universe, that doesn't sound very hard. So believer, plan and sleep. Strategize and Sabbath. Your God reigns. But not only that, notice the significance here. We've been identified with God's covenant people. Because when Esther spoke of the Jews as my people, she well understood that she would either die with them or she, she would either live with them and be delivered with them. And yet because God had been at work behind the scenes, her union, her attachment, her identification with God's covenant people meant salvation both for her and for her people, according to the flesh. And if you are going to be saved from the judgment of God that is to come, you must belong to God's people. And friend, for that to happen, you don't need to have had a church background. Uh, you, you don't need to have read all 66 books of the Bible. You don't need to know all of the, the, the Christian lingo or the Christianese or all of the fancy theological words. You must simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Because to believe on him is to be identified and is to be welcomed into the communion of his people. It's interesting, whereas Haman died in the place pre prepared for Mordecai, Jesus died in the place prepared for us. Jesus took the punishment for our sins so that we would never have to experience that ourselves. Jesus stood where I should have stood. And Jesus was punished as I should have been punished so that I would be free forevermore and receive eternal life in him. But not only that, be reconciled and welcomed into the company of God's saved people. And friend, if you are to be saved today, if you are to be saved tomorrow, if you are to be saved on the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, you must belong to the people who have his salvation in and through his death and resurrection. Turn then from sin. Turn from pride. Humble yourself at the lowest place in the world, the cross of Calvary, and be lifted to the very heights of heaven together with all the ransomed church of God. And that is what every unbeliever in this room must do. Regardless of, of where you are in your life, now is the time. Maybe you're young here today, but listen, you're not too young. Esther was young, and yet she was saved, and she was the instrument by which all the people were saved too. And you might be old, but you're not too old. Mordecai was older than Esther, and yet because of her identification with the people of God, he was saved as well. I was reminded this, this past week of a, of a story that a preacher tells sometimes about a man who was saved uh, through the instrumentality of his dad. His dad was a, an evangelist. And he was, this man was converted at an old age. And the preacher says this. He said the church had prayed for this man for decades. He was hard and resistant. But this time, for some reason, he showed up when my father was preaching. At the end of the service, during a hymn, to everyone's amazement, he came and took my father's hand. They sat down together on the front pew at the church of the people uh, as the people were dismissed. God opened his heart to the gospel of Christ 
and he was saved from his sins and given eternal life. But it did not stop him from sobbing and saying, as the tears ran down his wrinkled face, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. And my friend, maybe you can look back today on a wasted 80 years. But if you will humble yourself now, and if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you will be united to Jesus' people in Jesus' church, you will have no less of his salvation, no fewer of God's promises, no less of heaven to look forward to. Salvation full and free will be found in Christ and among his covenant people. Pride goes before a fall, but if you will humble yourself, you'll be lifted to the heights of heaven. And may you do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing a final song together. Let's pray.